The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Governor Mike Parson has appointed three people to fill three statewide vacancies since he took office in June 2018. One of those people was Scott Fitzpatrick, a Shell Now Republican who became Missouri State Treasurer earlier this year. Fitzpatrick joins us on the latest edition of Politically Speaking to talk about his transition into office and how he's been involved in the efforts to overhaul the state low income housing tax credit. Let's hit the music. This is Politically Speaking, the longest-running episodic podcast about Missouri politics. It's a little complicated in Bolivar because there is a Parsons family there. But we also knew that it was important to make sure that, that we got to where we needed to go. You know if you walk in a room and you're getting ready to make a decision and everybody in the room looks like you, you need to stop. And right now what happens in the United States Senate is as critical as anywhere else in the country. I really want the state to succeed. We want everybody to uh, know that we're all working together. I just worked hard to try to build my name where I didn't have the money. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, Jason Rosenbaum, a political correspondent with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining us in studio for the first time, Scott Fitzpatrick. I was mentioned the first time because this is not the first time you've been on the show, but you've you've come in by phone and by tape sync. So it's it's true. You are a real person and not a hologram. That is right. I, I didn't tape tape sync. I did not know that was what that was called. But, well, uh, it's when you put a microphone while you're talking on the phone, and I, I think that was the the second time. And obviously, I know you exist because I've been like talking to you in person for for many years. Obviously, but, yeah. but it was kind of a joke, but. Back then, you were a state rep representing kind of a southwest Missouri-based district. Now you represent the whole state. You're a statewide official uh, as the state treasurer. Uh, for our listeners who don't know, it, it was kind of a series of events that was triggered by Josh Hawley's victory in the U.S. Senate. Eric Schmidt was the treasurer, and then he was appointed attorney general, and then Governor Parson appointed you treasurer. And you've been treasurer for now about like 150 days, 160 days? They're so about, yeah, about five months. Did, did it surprise you when Parson chose you? I, you know, I was a little bit. I think any time you get picked to serve in a statewide office, you know, it's a rare occurrence. And so I think, you know, whoever it would have been would have been surprised, right, to a, to a certain extent. It's a, it's a great honor to have that, uh, that opportunity. And uh, I know there were a lot of people who were interested in, in the position. So, yeah, I was, I was a little surprised, but, but uh, excited as well. How many comments have you gotten about how young you are and about how, you know, you're a statewide official? Because you're, you're younger than I am, for example. Yeah. And I, I've often, like, talked with now former state representative Stephen Weber, who now is in California, by the way, about his youth to the point where it became, like, almost offensive to him. Have, you, have people mentioned that to you, or is it really just something that happened kind of the first time and is kind of fleeted after a while? It's, it's died off a little bit. I think that, uh, well, number one, I keep a little facial hair now, you know, to, to, to try to, you know, make people think I'm older than I am, I guess. But uh, it's uh, it, I haven't had a lot of that in the last uh, few, few years. I think people just assume I'm probably older than I am. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if people find out my age, they, they, or they're a little confused, but... Uh, you know, it's it's not uh, not a big deal, and I don't take offense to it. Yeah. Well, I'll just point out that uh, Elijah Har, who's older than both of us, yes. really was excited about being the first millennial uh, Speaker of the House, and I would say he's barely a millennial because I think he was born in 1982 or something yeah, like he's, that. Uh, he's, um, I think, five. He's he's no he's he's about uh, five and a half six years older than me. Yeah, he's a grandpa millennial. So, yeah, ba basically. And, but yeah. you're you're he's, an he's starting to get some gray hair too. He, he is. Yeah. Well, so am I. So I don't want to I don't want to hold that against the speaker. But we're not here to talk about. The good news <laughs> is he still has hair. Yeah, so. we're we're not here to talk about uh, ages of people. I want to spend the first part of the show talking about your experience being treasurer over the last 150 days. I, there have been a number of things that your office has done that I think are pretty notable. But I want you to explain, because this may be a basic question, and we've had other state treasurers on the show, but for people that don't know the basic duties of the state treasurer's office, I want you to explain that before you kind of talk about what you've done so far. Yeah, the, the state treasurer's office is uh, is about a 50-person operation, 5-0, uh, 50 
person operation, and uh, it's broken up into four different divisions, uh, and uh, and then obviously the the kind of executive staff uh, that uh, that works directly with the treasurer and typically changes over uh, with with a new with a new treasurer. So uh, the four divisions and the and the kind of functional or the constitutional functions that uh, that uh, the treasurer is assigned. Uh, are primarily we're the custodian of all state funds, and so every time the legislature or in the Constitution a new uh, function of government is created, oftentimes there's a, a fund uh, created for that purpose. And so we have to manage all of those funds, uh, make sure that uh, when we're investing, we're crediting the interest to the appropriate funds. We're responsible for uh, reconciling all the state's bank accounts. We have over 150 deposit contracts with banks across the state, and so we're managing uh, those relationships and our banking contracts uh, in, in the banking division of the office. And we also have to approve all state payments uh, that get made. So uh, every check that leaves the Treasury uh, or every dollar that leaves the Treasury has to be uh, approved by the Treasurer's office. Uh, and if it's a paper check, it has to have the Treasurer's signature on it. And so we send out about a million and a half paper checks per year and another few three to four million electronic payments per year. Uh, through the banking division, obviously, a lot of those, all those, almost all those payments are initiated by other other uh, departments within the state. But we have to do the final approval. And uh, in addition to that, we are in charge of the investments for the state. So basically, we take the state's excess cash on any given day, and the portfolio is a little over four billion dollars of cash that we invest for the state. And so each day, we're doing a daily cash calculation of how much money uh, we need to have to cover the bills or the checks that are outstanding and being presented. And then we take the leftover money and we invest that. Sometimes it's even just invested overnight in a repurchase agreement where we send the money out overnight, we get it back the next morning, and people pay us to keep the money overnight. But within the investments division, one of the things that we'll, uh, that uh, I think is more familiar to people is the Missouri First program. It's the linked deposit program. And we uh, basically what that is is a, it's an economic development program within the treasurer's office that allows – me as the treasurer to put the state's cash to work in Missouri banks, and it's called the linked deposit program in statute, and it's called that because what will happen is a small business or a farm that's looking to start or expand can go to a bank that's a participating lender, put in an application for a linked deposit through Missouri First and the treasurer's office, and uh, it's a pretty easy process, but essentially if somebody's looking to build a building or buy a piece of equipment, buy vehicles, you know, whatever it is, uh, they can apply for a linked deposit. We will put, uh, right now, and we'll talk about the reforms, we'll put money in the in the bank that sent in the application uh, at a reduced interest rate that the bank would have to pay us, and the bank turns around and, and loans that out at a 30% discount to market interest rate to the borrower. So on a 6% uh, loan rate, that would discount the rate to 4.2%, mm-hmm. and on a million-dollar loan, that's an $18,000 per year savings for the uh, for the borrower so uh, it's a it's a cool program and it's not a handout it's not a grant it's just a way to give businesses access to lower cost capital and that was gonna be my first question about what you've done in the first part of your term when we were talking I think at Children's Hospital after you made a presentation about able accounts you mentioned that you made some pretty significant changes to the program because it was running into some complications, so to speak. I want you to explain what you've done and how you think they've made the program more solvent or salvageable. Sure. The uh, the, the program is, in statute, it's capped at $720 million. So once we have $720 million placed in banks, uh, we're, we're done uh, with that program. And it's a five-year commitment. So every year you have, or every month, really, you have some loans roll off. But there was really, really big growth in the program uh, over the last couple of years under Treasurer Schmidt. Uh, almost three hundred million dollars was placed in the last year alone uh, with uh, with his office, and so what that did is it put some strain on the program in terms of, of growth. And we had to really look when we came in, what can we do to kind of slow the growth down to make the program still accessible to everybody, uh, but also to a point where we're not going to hit the cap, which would cause a lot of problems with the program uh, that would cause de- deposits to have to be pulled early and things like that. So we looked at. Uh, Looked at the program and said, "Look, uh, we need to probably put a limit on it because we saw loans in the eight to ten million dollar range that were getting approved, which are pretty large, uh, you know, pretty large deposits. That would be like a very expensive tractor, for example. Very, very expensive tractor. And uh, so we we put a limit on that of a million dollars. We ran some numbers and felt like a million was kind of where we had to be to slow the growth enough to keep it sustainable. 
We also eliminated refinancing of existing debt as an allowable use of proceeds. So what we saw were a lot of folks were basically just taking existing debt from one bank and then using a late deposit loan to to refinance the debt at a lower rate and just save save some interest payments that way. And that wasn't really keeping with the intent of the program, which is to create economic development and have new capital spent into the economy. Uh, so we did that. We set a a cap for how much any one bank or in, uh, financial institution could participate in the program because uh, we had one institution that was really growing, using it a lot, and it was gobbling up a lot of the cap space. So we uh, we put that cap in place, and then we changed the discount rate on the uh, deposits. We made it a little less. Basically, we, we made the interest rate a little higher to the banks on the money we were putting in. How, how successful do you think those changes have been towards, again, stabilizing the program? Like, I think you made those changes pretty early on. Have you seen big, big changes to, like, how the program is working since you've implemented them? It has slowed down the growth uh, pretty significantly, uh, but still, we, we didn't want to stop the growth. We didn't want to do anything that created uncertainty around the, the program and its future. Uh, but we wanted to do things where people could still look at it and know based on the rules out there. We didn't want to make it subjective. We wanted people to know that either, yeah, I'm going to qualify or I'm not based on the rules. And so uh, it was successful in that way. It's still growing, uh, maybe a little faster than I anticipated after the changes. Um, we did look at, at expanding, growing the cap a little bit because it's been, it's been at $720 million for a long time. But that would give us a little flexibility in the program. And we'll probably take another look at that next year and potentially work with the legislature on on allowing us to, to grow it a little bit. I want to talk about ABLE accounts because, as I mentioned before, I was at a presentation that you uh, were doing for the first time, I think, by yourself at uh, St. Louis Children's Hospital. Uh, my friend Ellie Glenn actually introduced you. I've known her for many years. She's a Northeast Missouri legend and also works for Children's Hospital. I want to give her a shout out to her on the show. So I think I've done like seven or eight other times. But this is a really interesting program, and it's not. Ju- I wasn't just interested because I have a child with special needs who I may or may not use this for, but I want you to explain what it does and how it can benefit people because I think one of the, your goals that you told me is to get the word out more about this program that I think could actually help a lot of people who are disabled. So I want yeah, you to could. give that. I want to give you that opportunity. Yeah. Well, first off, Ellie is is uh, she's great, and I worked with her when I was in the legislature, and she was the legislative uh, uh, liaison for the Department of Health, and a uh, really bright bright uh, gal, and uh, is doing well. It seems like so. Uh, I guess I'll echo the shout out. But uh, Able Accounts, and it was nice of her to set that up for us at Children's, so we could talk about that. Able Accounts. Uh, are a relatively new thing, and they're kind of a spinoff of a 529 account, which is a education savings account uh, that people can use to save for higher education. ABLE accounts are different, though, in that they are uh, designed for people with disabilities, and so either the people with disabilities or their families can save in an ABLE account for that person's future, and, and a lot of people know that uh, people with disabilities oftentimes need uh, government assistance in some way, whether it's Medicaid, SSI. But with those programs, there comes a limitation on assets. And, uh, you know, that's $2,000. So people with disabilities have, over time, been in a situation where they're kind of forced into poverty uh, by those asset limits, not ever being able to have more than $2,000 to their name. An ABLE account does a couple of things. One, money in an ABLE account up to $100,000 doesn't count against that asset limit. So people with disabilities can now actually have a job and save money and you know use that money to buy a car, reliable transportation, use it for housing. Uh, and and the, the nice thing about ABLE accounts is it's usable for lots of different things. It can be used for education. It can be used, like I said, for housing or for transportation, basic life needs, uh, uh, you know, basic services people need. And so it's a very versatile uh, tool for people that have disabilities to use. And, uh, you know, for somebody like me, I also have, I have twin boys who uh, both have special needs. And, I, you know, it's hard. They're young. It's hard to know exactly what their future is going to hold. So the nice thing is it's an alternative way for a family to save for their kid's future, uh, whereas, you know, a t- family with a typically developing child might save with a 529 account. Uh, you know, my family, we can use an ABLE account. And uh, if things go really well and they're able to go to college, then we can use the ABLE account on education. And so, uh, it's a, like I said, it's a relatively, relatively new program. We don't have a marketing budget for it, and that's why it's all word of mouth and us getting out and kind of beating the pavement for it. 
And so we just crossed the thousand, the thousand account threshold and had the two year anniversary when we were at Children's. And, uh, and that, that's, those are exciting milestones and the, the program is growing every week. Uh, and we're actually started an initiative now where we're working with employers in the state to try to uh, allow payroll deductions uh, for, uh, for able account contributions. And, and we just got Cox Health signed up uh, for that. And we'll, I think we're working with some of the other large employers in the state so that they can uh, allow their employees to have money withheld from their check to contribute to an able account. Why doesn't this have a marketing budget? Because for many years, 529s have had a pretty robust marketing uh, budget where I saw like Sarah Steelman or Clint's wife on TV talking about it. You know, I, I've i always felt like, and this is not meant to be critical of you or anybody else, but like oftentimes special needs policy gets pushed to the background because it doesn't affect everybody and it's right. not as, as, as wide ranging as people going to college. But it seems like this is a really good program that people may not know about, and I'm glad that you're you're personally talking about it on the show, but it does seem like this may need marketing, and there may need to be TV ads or radio. So is there any reasoning for that? So the way the 529 marketing budget works is that, you know, we have over $3 billion in assets in our 529 plan now. And we, and I, it was done under Treasurer's Rifle. It was the last time the contract for the management of the 529 plan was, was bid out. Mm-hmm. Part of that RFP process is to uh, spend some money on marketing and for the respondent to say how they plan to market the program. And so the, the asset manager, they have, they have a vested interest in the plan growing just like mm-hmm. we do as the state. And so we have a, a marketing budget built into the contract with the contractor on the 529 plan. Uh, but like I said, as over $3 billion in assets, I think we have around $5 million in assets in our That's ABLE right. plan right and now. Some of, and and I, to, to, for full disclosure, as always, when I have a treasure on, I do have a uh, 529 plan. So some of that money is my money. There you money. go. All so. right. Well, that, that is good. And so it's built into the fees that are charged by, okay. uh, you know, our, our program manager is a census, and they partner with Vanguard uh, on the investment side. And so it's built into their their fee structure that they have to spend a certain amount of money each year on marketing. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a good explanation. Do you do you uh, expect continued growth of people accessing the able accounts as the, the word of mouth that you hope uh, that you're doing gets out? Especially if you're going to like more rural areas where people do read like the daily newspaper, or right. you know, you coming to town is like a top story. And you talk about this subject, do you get a sense that that is kind of a way that people who may not be in being more rural areas and maybe in less connected areas than St. Louis are hearing about this program, for example? Yeah, I think that uh, our proactive efforts will go pretty much anywhere. We'll go, we will go anywhere in the state of Missouri to talk about ABLE. And if it's not me, it'll be a member of my staff with knowledge. With knowledge, uh, and uh, I'm I'm getting better at making the presentation. You saw the first one; it was. A little I thought it was pretty good. Now I was checking my phone during it, but oh, it wasn't because I wasn't interested. It's because I'm addicted to checking my phone. Yeah, so well, that's, we, I think we all have that. Uh, all, all of us are you? You're a millennial, right? So, I am a uh, millennial. All of us millennials I was born in 1984. I'm a real millennial. I'm not like a borderline like Elijah Har or right. Jason Smith. Well, I, I'm, I'm 87, so I'm I'm right. I'm what, when's it in? I, I feel like I'm. I'm pretty right. I don't know, but but I don't want to delve into yeah. this topic anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's making enough. me it's making me feel closer to mortality, but continue. Yeah. Uh so uh the answer is yes. I think I think though anytime uh there's a family uh with uh somebody with special needs in that family, uh you're there's a plethora of information. There's so much coming at you all the time. And this is another thing, right? It's another thing that's coming at you that you have to learn and have to understand. And so we try to break it down and put it in the simplest terms possible. Everybody's always skeptical and want to know, well, if I do this, how's it going to impact that, you know? And so I think there are some hurdles there. And I think that over time, as more people people become familiar with ABLE accounts, some of that will break down and we'll have even more success growing the program. But we've had steady steady growth so far, and I expect that to continue. The, the other topic I wanted to talk about is something that maybe you're not directly – invested in, but something that you probably have been paying attention, that's the budgetary situation. You are sure. a former House budget chair, and oftentimes when you're out in the wild, people ask you about the state budget situation, just because I think you will do pay attention to that, and there's probably some connections to your job, current job, based off that as well. It, it did seem like, like when I talked with you, I guess in April, there was a lot of uncertainty about the budget situation, about whether there'd be a big shortfall or whether there'd be enough money to, like, avoid withholds or not. It seems like things not only stabilized, but went in a very good upward trajectory where governor just signed the budget, no line item vetoes, no withholds. 
like you you pay attention to this stuff more than most people. Like, how do you think you went from one point where people were very worried to a point now where we're barely talking about this anymore? Well, one of the the last thing I did as budget chairman it was shortly after I got appointed, but before I resigned or you know left the house, uh, was agree to the consensus revenue estimate. And so that the consensus re- revenue estimate was you know a process that I started and finished before I became the treasurer, and we agreed on 1.7 percent growth uh, for this year and two percent growth. Uh, for next year, I believe it's two percent for next year. So today we're at one point eight, uh, which is you know we've got about uh, what two weeks left in the fiscal year. Yeah. So um, I always felt pretty confident in that, and there was a lot of reasoning behind that. And obviously, at the end of the day, it's a guess. But I think what we knew going into uh, that time was, I, you know, I started this conversation with the Department of Revenue back in August about why is revenue off, and we really went through the process and figured out, you know, what happened really was that a lot of people uh, that had that were benefiting from the personal and dependent exemptions, which ended up going away in favor of a doubled standard deduction and other things in tax law that were offsetting to that. They didn't they didn't fill out their W-4 when they're you know filling out how they want money held out of their paycheck. They didn't uh, count on those those uh, uh, deductions. Mm-hmm. And so what would happen is when people filed their taxes, they would get a big refund back when they filed it and realized you know and, and realized that they were eligible for those those exemptions, the personal dependent exemptions. And so when the d- exemptions went away, that changed the withholding structure. So people had less money uh, held out of their paycheck all year because the standard deduction doubled. But then when they filed their tax returns, they weren't getting the benefit uh, that they had typically gotten at the t- at filing time of uh, the windfall of all those exemptions coming into play. And so what it was is really just a shift in timing of when the state collected the revenue. Um, and it, And so I felt pretty confident that Things were going to stabilize, and obviously, the further into the year it got, the less confident I got. But, but it ended up working out. It seems like. Uh, before again, we delve into more uh, contentious issues. One other thing I do want to talk about that your office is involved in is unclaimed property, because I think yeah. that's actually something that your office is associated more w- with than anything. Just because, oftentimes, there's like, you find, I don't know if you find like literal buried treasure, but you find odd things that people leave behind, I guess, in safe deposit box that you, you try to reclaim from them. Explain a little bit about that program and just what you've done differently or anything that's happened since you, you took office. So we have about a billion dollars in unclaimed property that we hold uh, in the treasurer's office that is property of Missourians. And it's growing by about $100 million a year. We get $100 million in new unclaimed property in every year. And how do you get that unclaimed property? It's like people just like how it's, does that it's happen? A, it's exactly. a sheeted to us through you know basically a lot of times it's uh, you know if an account's dormant for five years okay. that money is is a sheeted to us by banks and by uh, utility companies that got deposits from people when they uh, you know when they signed up for an account and they moved and didn't get their money back it can be life insurance proceeds where the insurance company couldn't find the beneficiary to pay pay out. Um, I got one. I got a postcard from my own office in my mailbox. Uh, because we send out postcards, we try to you know proactively locate people, and it wasn't to me; it was to the person I'd bought the house from that was that lived there before me. And I went to high school with the girl, and uh, so I sent her a picture of the picture of the postcard, and she said, "Oh, that's that's funny. I don't have unclaimed property though." And I was like, "No, the whole point of unclaimed property is you don't know you have it. It's uh, you, you do have unclaimed property." So we, uh, it's just a lot of people don't understand that you know how it works or why they would ever have unclaimed property. Uh, but we've been, uh, you know, we've been really focused on that. I think it's, uh, it's something. It's kind of one of the more fun parts of the job, honestly, uh, giving people money that they didn't know they had. That's what Clint's wife will said too, and I think Eric Schmidt said the same thing. That was probably the most fun part because you're making people happy. Yeah, basically, absolutely. It's one of the few times. As opposed the, to the next topic we're going to talk about, yeah. which is probably the least fun. But continue. Yeah. The uh, so it was just it, it's it's so we did some a few things the Joplin uh, you know there we did some proactive work there this the last couple months uh, around the anniversary of the 2011 tornado right so you think about things that can generate unclaimed property you know when when people pass away that's one event when people move that's another event when people change jobs and I think all those things happen in a pretty pretty significant way in Joplin after the tornado in 2011 right. And so we noticed that we had a kind of an excess of unclaimed property in that area. And so we spent time, you know, trying to proactively, like, find people in Joplin. And then we actually, a couple of weeks ago, went to Joplin, set up in the mall, set up at the library uh, over a couple of days. 
And through that effort, we've been able to return about $330,000. We've closed over 1,600 accounts in Jasper County alone from that proactive effort. Uh, and that's kind of rewarding. You, know, you get to reunite people with their money, and, and it's uh, just a really cool part of the job. And I imagine that if you want to find out if you have unclaimed property, you go to a website, you, you type in your name. Yeah, you can you can pick one, whichever one you like better, treasurer.mo.gov. There's a search bar, bar up top. You can type in or showmemoney.com, whichever one you trust more. And uh, they're, they're, they're both uh, our websites, and you can search and find your name on there. We'll be back after this break with State Treasurer Scott Fitzpatrick. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. And we're back with State Treasurer Scott Fitzpatrick on Politically Speaking. I want to talk about the topic I alluded to that was probably not super fun this year, and that's low-income housing tax credits. In fact, the reason I mentioned that kind of flippantly is when we asked Peter Kinder what was the least favorite part of his job, it was dealing with the Missouri Development Housing Commission, just because there's a lot of politics around it and there's a lot of people with differing opinions about how this tax credit should go. And I don't think he enjoyed it very much. So I'm not sure if you've had any more fun dealing with this issue, but my understanding is the answer is no. Is that fair to say? It's Yeah, fun's probably not the appropriate word for it, but uh, it has been interesting. I can say that. And it's, uh, you know, low-income housing policy is probably the most complicated area of policy that I've kind of gotten into during my entire time in state government. So it's, it is complicated. And just for our listeners, the reason we're talking about this with you, and we've talked about this with Eric Schmidt when he was treasurer, and we talked about it with Mike Kehoe when he's lieutenant governor, is you sit on the MHDC. So you make the decisions about who gets low-income housing tax credits. We're still in a situation, though, where state ho- state tax credits have been frozen since December 2017, but you still dole out federal credits. So, Correct. So I think that those are still going to pass. The reason we're still talking about this is even though Mike Parson, as lieutenant governor, was a big proponent of the low-income housing tax credit, he said this in December of 2018, which kind of led us to the 2019 session. So you're basically saying, I know I know we've talked a lot about hard and fast things, like are you going to veto something, are you going to support something? If there's nothing done by the end of the session, you're not going to restart the program. That's correct. That, That's that, correct. that is something you're actually going to be hard and fast That's on. That's correct. They, I, they know that, and I've been open about that the entire time, and I aim to stay. As I said before, you're, it, you're on very much on record of being supportive of this program. And a lot of people on both sides of the aisle are because I've, I've toured low-income housing uh, pro- projects before. It is some of the best housing low-income elderly and, and veteran people get. On the other hand, you know there could be people who are skeptical since you have been an advocate for this in the past that you're really going to push forward more than surface level reforms. I want you to address that potential no, criticism. No, I, I mean, we're, t- we're talking about real reform here, and, and it's my job to prove that. So at the end of the day, I'm going to have to be able to say, how did we really reform this program in policy, in the regulatory side of it, in, in the financial side of it? How are we going to do it? But all that's got to come into play. And how do we even streamline the agency itself? Yeah. You know, so I mean, we we're gonna we're gonna t- totally overhaul that. Much like what we're doing with the Department of Economic Development, you're gonna see major changes. Well, spoiler alert: there was legislative push to do what the governor wanted, but nothing came of it when the legislature ended because I think there were very different opinions from the Senate and the House of what they wanted, and you got involved in this process because I think that you were much more inclined to support the House version of what they were trying to do in the Senate version. I want you to kind of explain what your role was here for, for people that weren't paying attention. Yeah, well, a couple things. Number one, it like I said, it's the most complicated area of policy I've dealt with since I've been in public office. So, you know, the Senate got started early with, with the bill. It was actually kind of surprising to me how quickly, uh, you know, they got it to the floor and got something sent over to the Senate. And I hadn't, honestly, I'd just become treasurer, you know, and it was uh, it was a new area of policy for me to really learn about. I knew, you know, before uh, I became treasurer that I had some concerns about really the efficiency of the program. And, and when I talk about efficiency, I talk about, you know, what we're doing is we're issuing tax credits, and those tax credits are redeemable against tax liability. Uh, but the people who get the tax credits have to turn them into cash, and there's a pretty significant devaluation that occurs from the time the tax credit's issued to the 
you know, the time that the the, yeah, the developer that gets the tax credit turns it into cash to build housing with. And so I really wanted to learn more about how to how to kind of eliminate some of that efficiency and try to inefficiency I should say, and try to make it uh, make the program just a little better. Uh, and the Senate moved quickly, and what the Senate proposed doing was really just reducing the amount of the credit that we issued, right? And so currently we matched or we're allowed to match under law 100% of what other federal government does for that credit. The Senate version of the bill took that down to 72.5%, which is a good start. You know, I mean, I think it, it helps rein in the cost of the program. But it, doesn't, it didn't do anything about the efficiency problem, which was really, I think, the reason that this program became kind of a subject uh, for a lot of people to debate, right, with Governor Greitens, uh, you know, in terms of what he and did. And even Governor Nixon. We've been, we yeah. were having this, and, and I don't, you know, this debate happened before you came to the legislature, but there was a whole special session on this. It was a disaster. And mm-hmm. the efficiency question also came into play, too. But, you know, this has been going on for 10 years. This is not a new debate. Correct. This is not a new arena that you've entered, but continue. Yeah, and, and, and quite honestly, it's it's one of those things, I think the reason it's gone on so long is because it is a difficult area of policy to understand and and so we wanted to get involved and try to help with that help educate and we had to do research i'm talking we talked to people from other states and uh, we talked to people in the industry uh you know accountants that have that dealt with these credits lawyers it so we talked to a lot of people try to gather a lot of information so we worked with uh, the chairman of the house economic development committee Derek greyer who uh was you know became the chairman was in charge of the bill that representative gregory uh had had filed we talked to Representative Gregory about it as well, and and so ultimately what happened was the Senate bill went to uh, the General Laws Committee, and you know I felt like you know it was kind of my job at that point to try to be involved in in uh, trying to get something more than just a cut to the program passed, and so I testified on the bill when it was in its public hearing, and I encouraged my former colleagues in the House to adopt some of the ideas that we had worked with Derek Greyer on. And they did. They adopted a, a few things that are complicated policy. I'm not sure we really want to get into those. Yeah, you, you, it's very complicated. But, and, and, yeah. but, but if you could summarize them as succinctly as you can, yeah. just want to make sure we, we don't paper over what you were right. trying to do. Well, one, one thing is, and I think you know, MHCC can do some of this. We can do some of this as a board through MHCC. One thing was uh, creating a scoring system that's public and transparent because right now, I think one of the main complaints within the industry really is that they don't know how these projects are picked, right? You know, staff kind of goes through, and I think there's the perception that there could be some political influence that that goes on in the in the determination of which project gets projects get picked, and that's something I think that's that's really you know as a as a somebody who's been in business and who's competed for things uh, before, I really like when I know why I didn't get a project, you know, uh, and so I believe that transparency and scoring is an important piece. That was in the bill. Uh, another thing that was in the bill uh, was making the credits transferable. So we're, we're giving, what this program is, is we're giving tax credits to developers that are redeemable over 10 years that they have to then turn into cash. And the process for turning those credits into cash is a little bit easy, or sorry, a little bit difficult. It's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> uh, it is very complicated because the credits are not transferable. They're not freely transferable. Scott Fitzpatrick couldn't go get awarded a low-income housing tax credit and then go sell the credit to Jason Rosenbaum. No. Jason Rosenbaum and Scott Fitzpatrick would have to get together with some other people and create a partnership agreement and go through and transfer the credits and allocate them within this agreement. So it's a very complicated uh, thing that we've seen in other states where they have an option between, that they give the developer an option to pick a transferable credit or a credit where it can be allocated within a partnership that giving that choice to the developers resulted in better outcomes. And so we've push that as well. So that's kind of the, the 30,000 foot view of right. a couple of the things that were in there in addition to the reduction in the amount that the Senate had. And I guess I said the outset of this conversation, nothing ended up passing. And right. I, I, I think the transferability part was a sticking point. Yeah, It did pass out of the House. So it passed I think out of the for House. clarification, yeah, it went out of the, it did get out of the committee, it passed out of the House, and then it was uh, there was kind of a sticking point between the House and the Senate on, on the bill. Now, based off that clip that I played from Governor Parson, where he was very at, I mean, there were, I'm going to try to say this as charitably as possible. I've talked with people that are advocates of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and they're trying to make the case that since things passed out of the Senate and the House, therefore that constitute action. If you listen to what Governor Parson said, that's not what he meant. He wasn't talking about pass out of one chamber, I'll restart the program. He actually wanted something done to keep that leverage on. 
obviously it's his decision on whether he wants to basically tell his appointees on MHDC to restart the program or not. But you're on MHDC. Mm-hmm. And would you vote to restart the program based off of based off of what the governor said he wanted? I know you, you and the governor don't have to do exactly the same thing, but his command or his directive at the beginning of or end of last year was pretty clear and it doesn't seem like it was accomplished. What's kind of your view of that? Right. I think that the you know, some of the things and one of the arguments I made from with uh you know, on the Senate bill was, you know, the commission can vote to authorize 72 and a half percent of the state, you know, of state credit. So I, I wanted, and I think everybody that I talked to that was for reform wanted the legislature to give the commission the ability to do some things they can't do right now to make the credit more valuable on the secondary market when they're sold. And, uh, and so that didn't happen, right? I mean, I think that we will continue, we'll, we'll continue to issue federal credits. Uh, I'm working with the governor's office now on a scoring system. I mean, they've, they've been working on that. We're trying to engage with them on that. And uh, uh, so we want to go ahead and make those parts of it uh, very transparent uh, if we can. Uh, but I, my expectation is the governor won't start the, restart the state credits. I think, you know, I was in, a, I've been in meetings with the governor on this issue and his, he is very uh, clear that he's always been a supporter of this program. But he also said, look, at the end of the year, this is an issue that's always still on the table, and I want to get something done. And so, you know, it was late in the session where we kind of finally came to a place where we could, uh, you know, the industry was, was kind of moving a little bit towards supporting something, and the governor really did lean in, at, you know, at the end of session to try to get something done. And there was, you know, there were a couple of things. It was pretty late, honestly, and I think that uh, given another shot that we have a lot higher likelihood of success because more people have learned. There's been a lot of more discussion, a lot more learning has taken place. Uh, but the governor, you know, he supports the program, but he also has said he wants reforms. He wants he and I have the same goal in that we want the program, if we're going to do it, to be the best it can possibly be. And I, I hesitate to say this based off 2011. Do you think this may necessitate a special session? Well, that's a decision for the governor to make. And I, I think any time you talk about a special session, you want to be pretty dang sure you've got people on the same page. Right, because they uh, thought they were on the same page in 2011, and they were not. And yeah. It, it was, it was I, and I, I know I, I talk about this occasionally on the show. It was by far the most disastrous legislative, not only special session, one of the most disastrous legislative anythings I've ever seen in 13 years. And given how politically prickly this issue is, you better have your ducks in the row or it's going to end up the same way, yeah. basically. So I've seen, the- I've seen no indication that we're headed towards a special session on the issue. Now, obviously, things can change. And if there was some reason to have another special session, you know, some other issue comes up that would necessitate a special special session. Uh, the governor could certainly make uh, tax credit reform part of that call, uh, but I've seen nothing yet to indicate that we would be headed towards a special session. And this is Senate Majority Leader Caleb Browden talking about kind of the future of this issue. He plays a pretty major role here because he does kind of decide what things get on the floor or not. Um, and I wanted to give a little bit of a chance for him to talk about what he th- thinks about not only whether the governor should restart the program or not, but also kind of the legislative future uh, that we kind of just talked about. Ultimately, it's his decision. I, I, I'm not going to try to try to dissect what he said or didn't say. I mean, I think it's a good program. And, and again, you know, the, the point that I did make in there was I, I told the House what I thought I could get back through the Senate, and the, and the uh, transferability piece was not one of those things. And so, um, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to get past that. If he turns it on, okay. If he doesn't, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, assuming maybe that he doesn't, uh, we're going to have to figure it out because I do think that the, the program is a good program. I understand the folks who have, have concerns about it, um, but it is a good program. And, you know, I, the people that I hear from in Columbia um, aren't the big developers. They're, it's, uh, you know, Phil Steinhaus of the Columbia Housing Authority and, and uh, the folks who, put, who, who built Welcome Home and, you know, folks like that. I hear more about uh, LIHTC from, from those folks than I do, you know, I think the guys who get scrutinized uh, more heavily. So, it's unfortunate we didn't get it done, and the governor's do what he's going to do what he's going to do. So I wanted to ask a question, kind of on an, on the devil's advocate part of people that support the program, because as I kind of mentioned in that clip with Governor Parson, I have actually toured a lot of these facilities. I've met people that live there, and I think that this program does a lot of good for actual people. So my question for you is: Do you think that the decision not to restart the state tax credit program? may actually have negative public policy outcomes on, on cultivating more housing? Or do you think the fact that the federal tax credit is still being issued is kind of mitigating the, the potential negativity from that? 
Well, I think a few things. One is we're one of 15 states with a state light tech program, and of the states uh, with light tech programs, we're the second largest following Georgia. So, I mean, uh, a lot of states exist and, and deal with public housing needs, uh, you know, in, in other ways. I'm not saying that we should get rid of the state light tech program or anything like that. But I think what the le- what needs to happen, really, for us to be able to say we reform the program is that the legislature needs to give MHTC some tools in the toolbox that they don't currently have to make the, the program such that we're not issuing $160 million for the tax credits and turning around and getting $80 million for the housing out of it. Mm-hmm. The ha- I mean, that's the equivalent of the state. If the state wanted to go out and borrow the money for 10 years, it would be like paying 21% interest, uh, you know, in terms of you know, the way that we're funding this program. And so, um, you know, what what, uh, Senator Rowden said, he's, you know, nothing can pass if he doesn't want it to pass. Uh, I mean, when I say that, I mean he can stop anything from passing. Uh, He can't get anything passed, you know, because the Senate's a different place. But um, but so I think that, uh, you know, there was some evolution in the thought process on transferability of credits. And I do feel like that, you know, the will could be there. I mean, at the end of the day, there was a compromise uh, put out there that almost every single uh, stakeholder agreed to. Um, and I think that uh, the political will could be there to pass that bill. You mentioned the political influence on MHDC. This is kind of something that didn't get brought up. But I think one of the reasons there's a lot of political and political pressure is that a number of statewide officials who have to run for reelection and get campaign contributions are on this commission, including yourself, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Governor. Is there any thought of maybe taking you all off that commission and maybe having like multiple entities appoint other people? Obviously, you don't want a situation where it's only the governor, because if it's only the governor, the gov- it, it's de facto gov- governor control. But maybe like governor appoints a few people, uh, speaker, pro tem, maybe even the minority leader. So that it's like a multiple group of people that can't be controlled. Has that been brought up in this discussion or is that just not really one of the focuses of, of the quote unquote reform efforts? Well, I can say that it's been a part of, uh, you know, it's been a part of some of the recommendations that have been made. That's not a recommendation that I support. I think that there's a place for elected officials in this, you know, in this process that, uh, you know, and I think that elected officials should uh, should be able to, uh, you know, be a part of this board and not be corrupt. You know, I, and I and I feel like the the ones that we have. Uh, are all good people and and they're all not corrupt and so uh, you know I think that you know we can we can operate this this board uh, as elected officials and I think there is benefit because then people can hold us accountable for their deci- for our decisions whereas you know a lot of times if an elected official changes the people on a board still stay the same and yeah. so I think there's a place for statewide officials on the board and it should stay that way whether this issue actually sets the voting voter base world on fire is kind of... Probably not. Probably not, but it's an important topic, and it's also an important topic within the realm of Missouri politics and policy, which is why we're still talking about it. But in the last few minutes, I do kind of want to delve a little bit into your next uh, political step. Do you plan to run for a full term in 2020 as as state treasurer? Well, I will say that everything is, uh, is, is moving in that direction. I've enjoyed the work that I've been able to do, and I'm looking forward to continuing to do it. I'm going out. I've been all over the state meeting people, uh, meeting voters, and, and trying to let them know who the state treasurer is since they uh, didn't uh, elect me initially. Uh, but I, I really like the job, and I want to keep doing it. And so, uh, you know, obviously there's still time between now and filing, but uh, right now I'm, I'm planning to try to continue the service in the treasurer's office. It must be kind of a different mentality to go from running for a state rep district where your only competitive race was your primary in 2012. It's a very Republican area. I think it was actually, I don't think it was in your district recently, but it was in the Branson area, so I was certainly close to it. It, It's not many Democrats live there. So going from that to running statewide must be a pretty different planning process. Is that fair to say? Yes. Explain how it (laughs) is. Explain like what you have to do because again, the, the state has definitely drifted in a more Republican direction in the last four years. But, you you know, it is a traditionally Democratic state. And if you get you, and you're not you weren't elected to this position. So even though you are technically the incumbent, a lot of people probably don't know who you are. And you probably have to, like, reintroduce yourself during this sure. campaign. So, like, what is that process going to be like for you, especially if Democrats field a strong opponent against you? Well, I think it is. Number one is just 
trying to do a good job in the office and be able to talk uh, about the things that we're doing and uh, any opponent that that I have you know I would look forward to hearing what they think I should be doing differently or better obviously but uh, I, as you know co- campaigns cost money and so a big part of that is going out and raising funds uh, to the best of my ability and then uh, the other part of that is traveling and uh, I've been like I said I've been all over the state I'm gonna keep going all over the state uh, and uh, you know and I've actually kind of enjoyed I've enjoyed that I mean I've lived in Missouri my whole life. I grew up in the southwest corner of the state, but there's a lot of parts of Missouri that I hadn't seen yet. Like where? Well, uh, I don't know if I should admit admit this or not, but I really hadn't spent any time in St. Joe, which is one of the biggest cities in uh, Are you serious? Even I've been to St. Joseph. And I'm, I'm well, a, I've been I'm a, through, but I'd never like had I, a meal or anything like that. Th- neither. I mean, that's that I basically drove through to get gas yeah. there. I wasn't being. I, I didn't actually yeah. spend a lot of time there. But right. continue. Well, so I, you know, I've gotten to go there and spend time, spend time in St. Joe. Uh, you know, I was in, uh, spent time in Macon County, which was, you know, which was fun. Uh, had a, had a uh, meal at a great restaurant there. That the I name believe Toastmaster is based there, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, th- I mean, I'm seeing a nod right there because I've actually driven through there to get to Kirksville a couple of times. Got yeah. it. Yeah, believe it or not, I'm a very well-traveled person around it, Missouri. I've been to every corner of the state. It, been, yeah, it appears that way. I, I, but mainly, the only reason I've been to Northwest Missouri, though, is because they have a tremendous library conference there that I actually went to with my wife when she went there. I got to tell that to Senator Hageman, and he was very excited that I was visiting his district. But I don't want to spend any more time bragging about my travel habits. Yeah. I know you have other places you have to go, and I just want to thank you for coming on and talking about your office and also about the, the Lie Tech program because I think it was very beneficial for our listeners. I hope it was, and uh, you know, I'll, hopefully uh, I'll get to meet uh, a lot of your listeners over the next couple of years. I was in Piedmont uh, a couple of days ago and Polk County. I'll show you a picture I saw of Governor Parson. I saw that County. on your Twitter. He yeah. had a mustache. He did. It looked good. I think he should bring it back. I, I think we should start a you know one of those what are they the petition websites. You know. Well, I don't think there's been a governor with facial hair in a long time. I mean, I'm trying to go back and okay, so Greitens didn't have any. Nixon didn't have any. Blunt didn't have any. Holden didn't have any. Mel Carnahan didn't have any. John Ashcroft didn't have any. Uh, Kit Bond didn't have any. Teasdale didn't have any. Like it's been your Missouri governor history is on point. And, yeah, uh, I, I mean maybe one of the Northeast Missouri governors had like long beards or something. I'd have to yeah. ask Ellie Glenn about that, but I'm not I'm not really sure. But maybe, maybe we can get like a bet going where Parson where the governor will agree to uh, to grow his mustache oh out of his. We are we are going off the rails here. Yeah. For all, all right. of our stories, stlpublicradio.org. Follow me on Twitter, Jay Rosenbaum. How can people follow you on Twitter or your office on Twitter as well? Uh, at Fitzpatrick Mo and uh, Missouri Treasurer. Thank you very much. Until next time, so long. Come on!